Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. I was just pogging at the merch that Chili Pepper has on. Don't you want to wear it too? This one's a lot longer. 50 minutes almost. The year is 2013. Here's every A press minimally required to collect all 120 stars in Super Mario 64. That's 208 of them. Some stages, like most of the early ones, are already pretty empty, but the later stages, especially the very vertical TikTok clock, are a total nightmare. A revolution is about to happen. In just two years from now, nearly all of these will be gone. Bro, what is even happening? Why are there Goombas floating? Panon Koek 2012. Originally starting out just watching videos about the game, he started making his own mark in 2010 by posting videos of getting all the coins available in every stage. But for some of them, he posted the maximum possible score of 255, way above the actual coin count. He pulled that off using a complex technique that even he didn't fully understand at the time. Unfortunately, the videos are pretty complex technique that even he didn't fully understand at the time. What is even happening? <laughs> off using a complex technique that even he didn't fully He's like grabbing coins. Unfortunately, the videos are pretty low quality. They were done with some free trial of a screen oh, capture no. software recording Project 64. It could have been worse. It could have been some hot Ugh. garbage like we've seen before. By 2013, he felt like he had figured out the maximum coin count for every stage, so he moved on into a new direction. He began to investigate all sorts of glitches, sharing his findings in a couple dozen videos, until he felt like he had accumulated enough knowledge to tackle the A button challenge. On August 25th, he began a long journey through every single star in the game one by one by posting an A button challenge video for each and every one of them. Among the very first ones he did were two bob on battlefield stars, shoot to the island in the sky, and find the eight red coins. The main issue with those stars is needing to reach the floating island without using A, and the strategy he came up with was absolutely groundbreaking. While everyone else had been playing checkers, Pan and Koek busted out the 4D chess. This was the first stroke of a genius so legendary that it would later earn him his own Wikipedia page. This is the art of what? that it would later earn him. That's crazy. That's actually really cool him his own wikipedia page this is the art of cloning it's only natural that pan and Koek's first major technical breakthrough came through the use of a glitch that he spent years mastering with maximum coin scores what he spent years mastering with maximum coin scores before we delve into how this magic trick works we need to understand the cloning glitch and its underlying game mechanics Buckle up because it's time. Why does he need to like understand the... the cloning glitch and its underlying game huh. mechanics? Buckle up because it's time for a game physics lesson. Okay, a word of warning here. This is going to be very long, but I do not recommend skipping any of it. Cloning is well, to this gonna... day possibly the single most capital technique of this challenge, and skipping its explanation could leave you pretty clueless for a sizable chunk of this history series. What is so happening? Take out your textbooks and let's get started. <laughs> I like how this music keeps coming up. Before we get to it though, I need to point out that Pan and Koek has already covered this subject in scrupulous detail before. In fact, pretty much all the information on game mechanics that I will ever tell you comes directly from his past work. Whenever there's additional material to be read or viewed, there's going to be a numbered note down here. I will cover the most important information to know, but make sure to check out the video description for additional information and links to more complete videos on the subjects at hand. Cloning is made possible thanks to Mario's ability to grab objects. When Mario grabs an object, what you see in his hands is actually a visual copy of the object he's holding. The real object is made invisible and usually intangible until Mario releases it. Ah. We'll call these the original object. I didn't know that. Held object. That's interesting. Because the original objects. Is that why the the bomb clip glitch happens? 
I'm trying to think in my head how this works. You pick up the bomb. It turns invisible and intangible. You throw it. You know what? Maybe my best guess of what's happening is when the bomb... Uh, no, wait, that wouldn't work. make sense. No, I don't know. It still exists and is still loaded, but it simply cannot be interacted with. We refer to it as being in limbo. Its animation data is still being updated, but it's no longer being rendered. Meanwhile, the held object is an illusion cobbled together from okay, three so different this would sources. Be like a bomb. Its position is tracked independently, its rotation is copied over from Mario's rotation, and its animation is copied from the original object. What happens with the original object's position depends on what type of object it is. Some stay in place, and some follow Mario Oh, okay, so it's not like, okay. ...or near his position. An interesting case to look at is the bob its fuse is oh, lit is he gonna and explain it? it, which causes it to start smoking. Yeah. Because the held object is just a visual copy, it's not capable of generating smoke particles. The original object is kept close to where the visual copy is so that the smoke particles coming out of the invisible oh. bomb appear to be coming out of the bob bomb Mario is holding. That's, re that's interesting. Bob bombs are an exception in that they stay tangible when held, and that is the root cause of the bloated bob bomb glitch. For a few frames before it explodes, a bob bomb dramatically increases in size. If Mario grabs it at the right moment, he can hold it in its bloated state. Mario is then pushed back by the collision with the invisible bloated bob bomb, and it will keep following him around so long as he's holding it. But what happens oh. if Mario grabs the bob bomb while it's exploding? Well, this is where it gets fun. But before we get there, we need to understand. I didn't know you could do that. Well, this is where it gets fun. But what happens if Mario grabs the bob bomb while it's exploding? I didn't know that was possible. Well, this is where it gets fun. It must be frame before perfect. before we get there, we need to understand how grabbing and releasing an object works. When Mario grabs an object, multiple things need to happen. First, the object is established as the target of the grab. Then, Mario's state needs to be changed to holding an object, and the object itself needs to change its state to being held, which turns it invisible and intangible. Again, most of the time. For this whole process to function properly, Mario and the original object need to be linked somehow, otherwise Mario could never retrieve an object in Limbo. To achieve this, the game uses a very simple system. Every object that is loaded is assigned the first available slot of 240 object slots. While in reality, object slots have addresses that look a bit like this, for simplicity's sake, let's instead give them a number which ranges from 1 to 240. When Mario grabs an object, the object itself is put in limbo and Mario is given a reference number that links him back to it. That reference is the held object, or that visual copy of the original object. The only information the held okay. object needs to have is the number of the slot the original object belongs to. So long as the object is being held, it will stay loaded in limbo. When Mario releases the held object by throwing or dropping it, the game looks at the reference number and it brings back the associated original object from limbo. But remember, the original object's position in Limbo doesn't reflect the position of the held object while Mario is carrying it around. When the object is brought back, its position needs to be updated to reflect the held object's last position and complete the illusion. That position is tracked as a set of XYZ coordinates conveniently called the held object's last position, or the hope for short. While Mario is holding an object, the hope is constantly updated to match the position of Mario's hands, and as soon as Mario releases it, the original object is instantly warped to the hope as the held object disappears. So it definitely has to do with that warp. But key detail. To help create a seamless transition, the original object isn't placed exactly at the hope depending on Mario's animation. When Mario is dropping an object to the ground, the game aligns it with the hope horizontally, but places it at Mario's vertical position which sets it down on the ground. Most of the time, this entire process is seamless and goes exactly according to plan. But it's not airtight, and the tiny cracks in it are just enough to let a clever and meticulous player cause okay, a complete meltdown. Okay, this meltdown. grabbing coin thing is that insane when an object to is me. Being grabbed, both Mario and the object change their state independently from each other and are linked together by the held object. In the case of a diving grab or a water grab, all of this happens at the same time. <sighs> But for a punching grab, the signal to change states is established two frames before the actual state change. This gap can be abused if the original object unloads during those two frames. There are multiple ways to cause that to happen. The most common are to let a cork box sit still for 30 seconds and to grab it in the final two frames before it disappears, or to grab a bob bomb as it's exploding. 
Anything that causes an object to unload within two frames of Mario grabbing it with the plunge grab will work, but it's also achievable by touching a loading zone, a trigger that unloads part of the level and loads another part in its place. Unloaded objects can no longer be updated, which means that the original object does not go into limbo. However, Mayu still receives a reference for it in the form of the held object, but that held object is now linked to a vacant object slot or a slot that is ready to load any new object in it. A vacant slot is marked as empty and its contents can no longer... Okay, so... From what I remember... He said... The way that the reference object is made is it's put into the uh, the first available slot. Because the slot is vacant now, that's going to be the first available slot, and it's going to fill that. But that's also the reference of what Mario is holding. So when he throws the next thing, that will pop up. I think that's how it's going to work. No longer be modified. As a result, the held object looks invisible or frozen since it represents the final state of the original object before it unloaded. When a new object is loaded in that slot, the reference now points to a completely different object than what was originally intended. While it appears like we've cloned a new object, this is not true yet. Mario is merely holding a reference to the new object and because that object is not in limbo, it looks like there are two of them at once. However, when Mario throws what he's holding, you can see that the copy disappears and the original object is warped near Mario's position. But what happens if the new object cannot be thrown, like a Goomba? Each grabbable object has a script that takes care of its behavior when grabbed, dropped, and thrown. If the new object is missing that script, it will simply do nothing when thrown. Its behavior script will essentially be erased and it won't be able to function normally anymore, so it will stay frozen in place. This huh. has a very important side effect when the object being cloned has a spawner. Spawners are put in place to handle the loading and unloading of a group of objects like a coin line, a coin ring, or a Goomba trio for example. When Mario moves far enough away from the broken Goomba, it remains loaded yet its spawner doesn't get the memo and so it also keeps working just the same. So the Goomba can be spawned again even though a broken copy of it already exists and it has successfully been cloned. Because the process of cloning involves erasing the behavior of the object being cloned, it suffers from inherent limitations. First, the object being cloned needs to have a spawner, otherwise it can only be transported. That can still be useful though, Makes and sense. in fact, it is still referred to as cloning even you, if the- It's crazy these things that you that can, can grab. That can still be useful <laughs> though, and in fact, it is still referred to as cloning even if the object in question isn't actually- That's duplicated. insane. But the most important limitation is that a clone cannot move or behave anything like the object it's supposed to be. Luckily, the interactions that Mario can have with an object aren't handled directly by the behavior script, so clones can be interacted with. Unfortunately, the okay. missing behavior script is responsible for handling the interaction status of the object, so after a single interaction, it also multiplies. Oh. So while Mario can interact with a clone, he can only do it once. Okay. For example, throwing a coin clone causes Mario to collect it, but leaves it frozen in place. And so that explains why, uh, when I was asking on that TikTok clock clip why he's not grabbing any of those coins. Okay, that makes Impossible sense. Impossible to collect again. Throwing a Goomba clone causes Mario to immediately be knocked back by it, after which it Surely. becomes frozen and intense. I muted it back then. There has to be a way, though, to not hit that Goomba like you're going fast enough or something. Because in the clips we saw, he was bouncing off Goombas that were in the air, so he has to, there's got to be a way. Tangible, essentially making the clone utterly useless. Fortunately, there is a workaround. If Mario throws a Goomba clone while he's falling fast enough, yeah, Mario will speed. move out of the way as he releases the clone and they will not collide. So Mario can come back and bounce on it once, and only once. So all that Panic Panic had to do was to clone a Goomba and throw it while falling, then come back to bounce on it and reach the island, right? That, that's so Wrong. insane. There is one more major problem. To release an object clone, the object being cloned has to be close enough to still be loaded. Okay. I wonder if you can 
No, that probably did. I don't Bike know. objects in limbo, which are forced to stay loaded for as long as Mario is holding them, cloned objects aren't bound by this rule, so they unload when Mario goes outside a certain radius from their spawners. While over here, the Goomba trio under the Allen can be loaded, over there, they no longer can. This called for another trick from the bag, remote release. What seems like two hours ago, I said that the held object's last position is constantly updated as Mario walks around holding something. It turns out that there's a way to prevent it from being updated. There are a few ways to do this, but for now, we're going to look at the hat in hand glitch. The animation for putting on a hat has two stages. During the first stage, Mario is holding the hat in his hand, and in the second stage, the hat is on his head. When Mario picks up the hat, the first stage is triggered, Mario starts holding the hat, and the animation plays. Now, if Mario is already in the second stage of the animation, and he comes across a second hat to put on, this new hat will be put in his hand, but the animation will finish by oh, okay, The that's result cool. is that Mario ends the animation with his hat in his hand. Putting on two hats in quick succession can happen either by duplicating hats using a warp, or by reusing a special cap box before the first one expires. This glitch has important ramifications regarding the hope. If Mario grabs an object while holding a hat, the object will still be held like normal, but Mario will look like he's holding his hat instead. Because the held object isn't being rendered, the hope is not updated like it should. This causes the hope to become disjointed from Mario because the position remains frozen to wherever it was last updated. For example, if Mario releases a quirk box here, then performs the hat in hand glitch and throws a bomb, the bomb will be released where Mario released a quirk box earlier because that's where the hope still is. Oh. This is known as remote release. What Despite the, the complex heck? setup and many drawbacks, this is That's how Baron Koic managed to get onto the island in Bob-omb Battlefield without using A. First, he grabbed an exploding bob which gave him a reference to a vacant object slot. Then, he carried it to this gap where he released it to place the hope in midair. Next, he did the hat in hand glitch and used another bob to clone a Goomba from this trio. Using remote release, he transported that Goomba over to the Hope where he could go and bounce on it. Just one Goomba wasn't enough, he needed more to make a bridge to the island. But here's the catch, to place a Goomba further along, the Hope needs to be further along, which means Mario himself needs to be further along, so he needs to bounce on this Goomba to place that Goomba. But remember, then that Goomba is gone, so he has to do it again. Once. So once Mario bounces on the first Goomba to place the second Goomba, the first Goomba becomes intangible. So after placing the second Goomba, Mario needs to come back and place a third Goomba yeah. next to the first one so he can bounce This is like two. binary. <laughs> this process becomes more tedious the longer the gap is, and exponentially so. You see, it's sort of like counting in binary, except the one- <laughs> I just said that! ...are Goombas that you place, and the zeros are gaps that need to be filled. The length of the bridge is the- That's insane! That in a row. Therefore, for a bridge of length 1, you need a single Goomba. For length 2, you need 3 Goombas. Length 3, 7 Goombas. Length 4, 15 Goombas. And for a bridge of length n, you need 2 to the power of n minus 1. This can rapidly become a problem, because the game crashes from having to draw too many triangles if there are somewhere around 40 Goombas on screen. That puts the upper bound of a Goomba bridge's length at only 5. In this case, Panin was able to get across using three Goomba bounces, which means he had to place seven Goomba clones to cross the gap. For the red coins, this was sufficient, but for this star, he needed something extra to reach the star. A Goomba to bounce on would be nice. There are two options to get that to happen. The first is to keep the same strategy, set up the hope under the star, then remote release a Goomba clone from elsewhere and reap the benefits. There is one major issue though. Because the wing cap box on the Allen doesn't allow for the hat in hand glitch to be possible, the cloning has to be done off the Allen after the hope was put on there first. A Goomba bridge is a single use infrastructure, so two trips to the Allen require two separate Goomba bridges. The second option is to release That'd be the 14 clone Goombas. at the location. Fortunately, the top of the Allen is close enough to these Goombas that they can be loaded and therefore cloned while on the Allen. Unfortunately, Mario can't release the clone without instantly bumping into it and ruining its purpose oh, because there's sense. no way to release it by falling from above. But falling isn't the only method to prevent interacting with a clone that's yeah, been released. Yeah, it's more different what if speed. instead, Mario couldn't be knocked back by the clone oh, that's because cool. he was already being knocked back by something else. Oh, that's a neat. A damage knockback forces Mario to drop whatever he's holding, and it also prevents him from interacting with a Goomba clone being released this way, so it is the perfect idea that's on neat. paper. 
but one hurdle remains. Mario still needed something to take damage from. Now if you remember two million years ago, I mentioned that dropping an object has a slightly different effect than throwing it. It places the object at the hope laterally, but at Mario's height, which, because the hope is usually somewhere near Mario's hands, effectively sets the object down on the ground in front of Mario. If the hope is disjointed, however, the effect can be wildly different. Remote dropping an object will place it at the point corresponding to the hope's lateral position in Mario's vertical position, which can be a completely new point otherwise inaccessible. If we go back to the bob -omb example, dropping the bob -omb causes it to be placed up there, Going back oh. to shoot to the island in the sky, the star is at a location whose okay. coordinates can easily be reached both laterally and vertically, but not at the same time. By throwing a cork box underneath the star's location, performing the hat in hand glitch, and then cloning a cannonball by dropping it here, Pan and Koek was able to release the cannonball at the hole laterally, but at Mario's height. That's actually this insane. Left the on the island, despite Mario never needing to go there himself. Finally, after cloning one last Goomba, he was able to release the clone by getting knocked back by the cannonball. This allowed him to place a Goomba clone without interacting with it, and he could use the bounce to reach the star without pressing A a single it's, time. It's interesting to me that you can time. dive, get or dive, roll out, and hit the box, but you can't grab the star like that. By getting knocked back by the cannonball. This allowed him to place a Goomba clone without interacting with it, and he could use the bounce to reach the star without pressing A a single time. You may wonder why Panin didn't simply remote drop a Goomba onto the island instead of I using actually, a cannonball. I legit was wondering that. That's because that. there's no way to be at the correct height while still being close enough to a Goomba for it to be loaded. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. The only Goombas close enough are clones, and because a clone never unloads, it also never reloads, so it's impossible to clone a clone. Also, I glossed over how the Goombas and the cannonball conveniently loaded into the specific object slot that Mario was holding. The reason behind this could be an entire video on its own, and in fact, Pan and Koek made that video already. But in short, when multiple objects unload on the same frame, such as a coin ring, a Goomba trio, or other groups of objects, they unload in the reverse order that they were loaded in. Through meticulous planning and deep knowledge of the unload in the on I need to see where that thick object slot, Pan and Koek made that. Okay, so. Okay, so it just reverses it. But in short, when multiple objects unload on the same frame, such yeah. as a coin ring, a Goomba trio, or other groups of objects, they unload in the reverse order that they were loaded in. Through meticulous planning and deep knowledge of object loading behavior, it's possible to manipulate which object will be loaded into Mario's hands. Here, Panin was actually just winging it, retrying over and over until he would get the result he wanted, just like he had been doing for years. But eventually, with enough time and research, he came to master the process of cloning. This groundbreaking strategy was one of the first ever contributions that Pan and Koek made to the A button challenge. Unfortunately, as ridiculous as it was, it actually wasn't an improvement. Unbeknownst to him, two years prior, the Japanese dancers already knew you could simply use a shell in a steep slope to gain super speed backwards and fly across the gap to the island that way. Of course. In fact, <laughs> most of Pan and Koek's first videos simply came to the same result as his predecessors. Nonetheless, he did start finding new improvements as well. The very first one was Wiggler's Red Coin. Wait, how is this the first one? It's not... It's not... Oh, crap. It's not this one? Why is it not this one? Wait, you can't see my mouse, can you? Yeah, I'm pointing at the one that's clearly before this one. Finding oh, it's because it's... Oh, wait, no. I have no clue. Yeah. As well. The very first one was Wiggler's Red Coins in Tiny Huge Island, using an idea from fellow Tasser Plush to use a slight kick bounce to reach this platform. This brought the total count down to 207. By the way, quick side note, the count was said to be 228 in 2011 and down to 208 in 2013. Like I mentioned before, early A-Press counts were fuzzy to figure out precisely for all sorts of reasons, and I purposely gave the most conservative estimate. This 208, however, is a pretty solid measure based on the full game-oriented thinking that was implemented during this period and retroactively applied to the known scores at the time. <laughs> the main discrepancy <laughs> the comes from getting the hit by fire to grab that's funny. The coin star with stump on a twomp to save 14 apresses, but there are multiple other small differences. Oh my gosh, that's so smart! After Wiggler's red coins, Pan and Quick revisited an old strategy for the red coin star of Rainbow Ride. The old 5A press strategy was to take the carpet ride to rise up high enough to access this platform in the maze using 1A press, then to navigate the maze with the remaining 4. 
but Pan Am figured out that you could simply keep reusing the carpet to fall into the maze using only this jump every round trip. With clever routing and platforming, this new strategy brought the A-Press countdown to only two. After another dozen stars nice. with no new improvement, he struck again, this time in Womp's Fortress. That's... Womp's that is, is insane. Simple star. You can get to the top floor of the fortress with no A-Presses fairly easily, but the fight itself required three ground pounds on Womp's back, which automatically meant three A-Presses. That is until Panin had the idea of luring Womp to the elevator and using the rotating platform to gain airtime and ground pound the miniboss with no A press. That's so smart! Unfortunately, while in the previous strategy the star could be collected instantly after the final hit, this luring strategy oh, yeah, that Panin you do would have to, to use find one A press. To collect the star without using A. Or he couldn't find any and left it at one A press, improving it oh, by yeah, yeah. two. His next stop was Tal Tal Mountain. Well, not exactly. First, he did a quick trip to Tiny Huge Island to throw this Chukya, then made his way to Tal Tal Mountain and saved two A presses on Scale the Mountain. He performed the hat in hand glitch using the warp to duplicate his hat, clone the Goomba, and then threw it. You can see the Goomba disappear, but where did it go? Well, it appeared right under the star. And this is why he went to Tiny Huge Island first. The hope only ever gets initialized once when the game is booted up. After that, it only ever gets updated when Mario's holding an object and stays frozen otherwise, including between levels. It's, that's crazy. That's insane. How do people figure when this Mario crap out? When Mario threw the Chukya in Tiny Huge Island, the hope was set at this position. Those same coordinates in Tal Tal Mountain correspond to the top of the mountain. That's right so the cool. So with a remote release, Pennon was able to place the Goomba up there from all the way down here. That is There's so one neat. Detail that I glossed over. How did Mario reach this point up the mountain without jumping? He did it thanks to a new technique called frame walking. Okay, that one. Mario one's... can run up steep slopes to a point, but he keeps losing speed until it dips into the negatives, at which point he slides down on his belly. However, when Mario's speed is low enough, if the stick is neutral and then forwards again, Mario will gain speed on the first frame, even on the steep slope. By quickly alternating between neutral and forwards, it's possible to walk up steep slopes that way. This climb saved one A-Press, and the Goomba clone at the top saved another. Now there are three other stars in Tal Tal Mountain that also required an A-Press to get past this point. Mystery of the Monkey Cage, Breathtaking View from Bridge, and the 100 Coin Star. Framewalking could get rid of that A press and all of them. This discovery marked Tal Tal Mountain as the second stage that could be fully completed in zero A presses. Cool. Soon after, Pannon looked into various stars, mostly from the basement levels, and he found some minor improvements to existing strategies along the way. He first went to the metal cap course, where a dive recovered from a crystal allowed him to get onto the switch in <laughs> oh zero A press, then found a few clever strategies in shifting sandland. He used tornadoes and fly guys to reach the red coins without needing to fly or jump, and he bounced on the hand on the I'm final surpri yeah. to reach the I'm red I'm surprised this, uh, the red coins ones wasn't found earlier. I mean, that seems clear to me. To me, like, all this, like, glitch stuff is not clear to me. But using, like, the, the actual mechanics? Red coins without needing I'm surprised. to fly or jump. And he bounced on the hand on the final hit in Stan Tall on oh, the pillars cool. to reach the star. He still had to jump once here to get out of the elevator platform and into the fight. He then found a minor improvement in Jolly Roger Bay by combining the 100 coins with the red coin star and by only using B to swim until he had to jump inside the cave for blue coins. Then, back in Shifting Sand Land, he cloned a cork box by using remote release to place it partly through the edge of another box and having it explode as it despawned, causing it to give infinite coins. This let him get the 100 coin star in zero A presses. Oh. Next, he went over to Big Boo's Hout, where one clever strategy allowed him to save A presses on four different stars. He manipulated these bookends to fly to a convenient spot, then used a double bookend bounce to save one A press That's going so to the neat. top of the mansion. This was useful in both Big Boo's balcony and eye to eye in the secret room. Additionally, he was able to manipulate the Big Boo to help him reach the top of this box and then the star without any additional A presses. Holy crap! Bouncing on bookends also allowed him to reach this red coin without using A, which obviously saved an A press for the red coin star. But also, that made the number of coins attainable in zero A presses go from 99 to 101, which meant the 100 coin star was now also possible in zero A presses. Another similar method helped save an A press in Hazy Maze Cave for the 100 coin star. 
Here, swoopers were used to bounce up to get blue coins and to kill a sniffit. And after all of these cute little developments, Pan and Koek felt that it was time for another revolution. He switched from Project 64 to Mupin. I wonder what difference this time, that makes. The revolution was not in the game itself, but technological. He finally got rid of his choppy free trial software captures and got a proper video encoding setup that is Mupin 64 Direct AVI Capture. But perhaps the biggest improvement was in passing capabilities. Project Dang, you actually have to use the jump states, there? So all of his videos up to this point were recorded mostly in real time, interrupted with pauses to use save states. Mupin64 offered frame advance, RAM watch, and many other tools critical to making a good task. He also started saving movie files of his input so that he could go back and improve them, share them with his peers, and archive them for historians to look at 8 years into the future. The result was a crisp, full 30 frames per second cinematic experience of the A button challenge for the second time in history, after the Japanese TAS. With this new high quality setup, he felt emboldened to tackle the most daunting level in the game, TikTok Walk. Yeah, this one's he began crazy. began by lowering Get a Hand to 0 A presses by figuring out a way to get up the entire rotating platform section by ground pounding into a butt slide face first into the wall. The bonking animation lets Mario stay on the steep slope of the rotating platform without sliding off just long enough that it has time to turn until it's no longer too steep to stand on. Alex Daniel did have a similar strategy that used one A press to get a little higher up at first, but Patton's new method could do it in no A presses at all. This new strategy did not only save A presses for get a hand, of course. Yeah, it's it turned probably out to be super useful, useful for pretty much every stars. star in the level. Yeah, it saved the only A press left for the red point star. He got rolled into the cage from four down to three. Wait, what? The A-Press left for the red point star. It doesn't look he like he's using an A-Press. It saved the only A-Press left for the red point star. Oh, the only one he got left. He rolled into okay. the cage from four down to three. Time jumps on moving bars from 11 down to seven by also using a precise heave ho flip to save an A-Press. And stomp on the thwomp from 15 down to nine with more efficient platforming combined with all the other strategies on top of also combining it with the 100 point star for good measure. Finally, the pit and the pendulums was also improved from 6 down to 4 using the rotating red coin platforms and a better jump up to save another A press. While he was devastating TikTok clock, Panin also tackled Bowser in the sky. The previous record of 13 A presses was relatively well done, but Panin found 3 spots where it could be improved. First, yeah. this section where precise slide kicks could let Mario get around these obstacles crap. instead of over them. Second, That's another precise dive nuts. recover let him cross the gap between these platforms, and finally, a Goomba manipulator. Another precise dive recover let him cross the gap wow. between these platforms, and finally, a Goomba manipulation huh. to bring it down to be bounced on, save the third That's impress smart. to bring the star down to ten. I'm surprised that wasn't Station, done already. Precise dive recover let him cross the gap between these platforms, and finally, a Goomba manipulation. Yeah, that one seems a little obvious to, to me. On, but... Save the third impress to bring the star down to ten. Pan and Koek's next stop was Dire Dire Dots. There, his first improvement was massive. He brought pole jumping for red coins, a nightmare of a star for the A button challenge, from 10 A presses down to 3.5. Wait, what? How does that make sense? There's actually no. I I was I was gonna think I was big brain for a second, like pressing and holding an A only counted as one, but the... no, that's not a it. simple explanation for it. Allow me to introduce the half a press. Water levels are a special kind of problem for the A button challenge because you need to tap A constantly to swim. If you don't press A, then Mario's underwater movement options are extremely limited. He can slowly sink down to the bottom, or if he's close enough to the surface, slowly rise up to it. He can grab with B, which moves him forward a little bit in this long animation. Or if he gets a hold of one, he can grab a Koopa shell and move around faster for a short time. But sometimes, Mario can be swimming while holding an object, a useful situation that we'll discover in a minute. In that case, B swimming can't be used because Mario would throw that object instead of swimming. There is one solution. If A is held instead, Mario will swim like this, including while holding an object. But since it does require A to be held, that method uses one A press. Or does it? It should, If you were right? to do the star in isolation, sure, that would be true. But in the context of a full game run, you could press A earlier for some other star that requires an A press, and simply hold out that A press. You hold A. 
and then you hold it through like all the that's crazy for as long as you need if you do that the two a presses would combine into one single long a press it achieves multiple purposes at once i would so why is it called three and a half yeah a i would presses? argue it should just be the point five three. notation serves as a middle ground to show the duality of the situation when counting the star by itself, you round up the A-press count to 4, and when taking other stars in consideration as part of a full game run, you would run it down to 3, because it would leech off of a previous star um, I think that's. I don't three think that makes sense. 3 and a half A-presses is better than 4 in full game runs, but worse than 3 in isolation, so it makes sense to fit it in the middle. Uh, now that that's cleared up... Nah, I would, I would just call it 3. I think full game runs are... Like, I don't know. I think it should just be two different categories. In isolation, it's four. And in full games run, it's three. It's just two different categories. How did Pennant actually improve that star by so much? First, he grabbed the Koopa shell from the bottom and carried it up to the surface. If Mario is swimming with the shell and the timer expires or he touches dry land, the shell will disappear. This timer, being quite short, effectively makes shells useless in normal play. But here's the clever part. This only happens if Mario is swimming with the shell, but he can also throw it. When Mario throws the shell, for a few frames he still holds on to it where he's no longer swimming with it. So by throwing the shell and interrupting that throw by surfacing, Mario bypasses destroying the shell and can keep it indefinitely. So now he can carry it wherever he wants. Ooh. However, the shell no longer functions like an underwater Koopa shell, but rather like any held object. To be able to go anywhere with it, Mario needs A to be held to swim. This is why this star requires an extra half A press. But where does he need to go with that shell? In that tunnel is a loading zone, a trigger that switches between the rooms when Mario crosses it. The switch involves unloading the first room and loading the second, all the objects in them included, to save memory. Now what happens if Mario goes through the loading zone and unloads an object that he's currently holding, like a Koopa shell? Cloning, of course. After unloading the Koopa shell, Mario holds a vacant slot which can now contain newly loaded objects that aren't supposed to be held. Again, with clever planning, Pan and Koic manipulated the pole to load into the slot that Mario was holding so that he would be able to carry it around and throw it somewhere. Note That's that because insane. poles aren't handled that by is Slaughter, insane. this is an instance of cloning that doesn't duplicate but merely transports the pole. So Pannon had to be mindful of which pole he would transport to make sure he didn't get rid of a pole he would need to use afterwards. After releasing the clone, he could climb it and reach the upper platform in a single A press. From here, it was mostly a matter of navigating around the poles without jumping, sometimes requiring some sketchy diving and grabbing. One more jump was required to get to the furthest pole, and back in the water he went. He needed another A press in a second pole clone to reach the final red coin, helped by the fact that these poles are actually longer than their visual model suggests. All that was left was the star, which unfortunately wasn't easy to reach either. But thankfully, just like any other object, stars can also be clone. <laughs> Remember that releasing an object clone oh my physically gosh. moves that object to the new location. Clones aren't just broken copies of an object, they are the actual object. They only become a copy if a spawner spawns the original object again. So the star that Mario is collecting is absolutely real. He's able to collect it remotely without any additional A presses, for a total of three, plus having to hold that's, them at the beginning. That's for crazy. For the rest of Dire Dire Docks, the half A press shell swimming strategy to clone a star was relevant for most stars, aside from Manta Ray's reward, which didn't require any A presses, and the 100 coin star, which for now Panin left alone. Also, Chest in the Current did require a swimming as well, not because of cloning, but because of the whirlpool forcing Mario to swim at least a little bit more efficiently. This brought down the total A press count by 4, because 4 stars that were previously listed as needing 1 A press could now be completed simply by leeching off of a previous A press instead. But the half A press was not going to be limited only to Dire Dire Dogs. It proved useful in Wing Mario over the Rainbow as well. Holding A has more benefits like falling slower while twirling, which remember was already known over a decade earlier. But also, holding A allows Mario to fall slower with the wing cap and to kick by tapping the B button. Kicking can help Mario get up steep slopes, although frame walking obsoletes that one. Here however, falling slower with the wing cap allows Mario to reach the bottom platform to shoot out from the cannon. 
Because this star still requires two cannon shots, the A press count was now 2.5. At this point, aside from a few stray stars, the only levels left for Pan and Coic to explore were Snowman's Land and Wet Dry World. Snowman's Land was already nearly figured out before Panon even touched it, but Wet Dry wow. World totaled 18 A presses, nearly half of which were for the Red Coin star alone. So there was a lot of potential for improvement. Panon started with Secrets in the Shallows and Sky. Note that because entering levels is also an implicit part of the challenge, oh. you can't just enter a wet dry world any way you want. The initial water level depends on the height at which Mario enters the painting, so with no jumps, the only available initial water level is the lowest one. Is that really how it works? Wow. I didn't know that. Thankfully, there's a warp to the cannon platform at the top of the stage, and there are heave hoes that can flip Mario up to higher levels. Panon used a combination of those to get most of the secrets, but the last one was a bit trickier. The previous strategy was to use a cannon shot to reach it, but instead he got a helping hand from Czechia. He manipulated the random number generated by the game, or RNG value, to be favorable so that Czechia would throw Mario directly onto the wooden bridge, which let him access the final secret in zero A presses. He used the same strategy to save an A press in Express Elevator, Hurry Up, and the 100 point star. Top of the town was still problematic because despite being able to get all the way to breaking the box in 0 A presses, he had to jump to get the star. The old yeah. strategy from 2008 was to use a cannon shot to go directly on top of the box and ground pound it. But remember, shooting the cannon is an unavoidable A press, so both methods came up to the same result of one A press. But the real problematic stars were Quick Race Through Downtown and the Red Coin Star. Those were sitting at 5 and 8 A presses respectively before Pan and Koek had a crack at them. The solution he found for each of them is pretty complex, so let's start with Quick Race Through Downtown. What the heck am I looking at? When Mario at? throws Chukya, it will explode into 5 coins upon landing. This explosion happens based on Chukya's state of being thrown. Here, Mario throws Chukya and falls off the ledge at the same time, which lets him catch up to it and intercept it while it's falling down. Chukya then grabs Mario in midair, which changes its state from being thrown to holding Mario. Therefore, when it lands on the ground, it no longer wants to explode, which effectively brings Chukya down to this level. From there, Panin abuses object collision priority and uses Chukya to push Mario inside of the block and throw <laughs> Chukya through the wall. Immediately after, he gets caught by Chukya again, and both of them fall down into the pipe below, where Mario can retrieve wow. Chukya and carry it around in the water. There are other ways to bring Chucky here, but this clever method uses no A presses to do That's so. That's so cool looking. Once Mario is holding Chucky underwater, he needs to swim. He could do that simply by holding A, but unfortunately that doesn't work after pressing B to grab an object, so he actually needs to press the A button once. But from there, he has a hold of an object and the tunnel contains a loading zone that switches between the main area and the downtown part of Wet Dry World so he can clone the quick race through downtown star. Note that the cloning of a star can only be done if the star is already out there and collectible, so the same can't be done for something like the red coins, for instance. But just like that, he managed to <laughs> get that star from 5 down to only 1 A press. That's crazy. The red coin star was definitely the most challenging because it posed multiple problems at once. To access most red coins, Mario needs to break a box, which he can only do out of the water. However, if the water level is low, then he needs a lot of A presses to reach the higher platforms. So he both needs the water level to be high so that he can navigate without using A, but also to be low so that he can break the boxes the coins are in. If he lowers the water to break a box, he needs a way to raise it back up, and the only crystal that raises the water is way up there, inaccessible on the water without jumping a bunch of times. This web of restrictions is nearly impossible to navigate. But if it's nearly impossible, it's not impossible. But there was a price to pay. In his own words, that star was a total pain to record and edit. And you know what? I believe him. The strategy takes 14 hours to execute. Of course, wow. breaking down how all of it works would be too gigantic of a task. So let's do it. <laughs> if you pay close attention, you can see that even when it's at a fixed height, the water level bobs up and down by a significant amount. This is not purely visual. The actual water level follows a sinusoidal function with an amplitude of 20 units and a period of 128 frames. In other words, the water has a median level and it deviates from that median by up to 20 units on a cycle that repeats every 4 seconds or so. The downtown area's water level is independent from the main area. 
when Mario goes from downtown to the main area, the water level is preserved for when he comes back. But here's the key thing, the current water level is saved and then used as the median water level when Mario comes back. Therefore, if Mario loads the downtown area and unloads it when the water is above the median, when he comes back, the new median will be here and the water level will rise and dip 20 units around that new line. If you repeat oh. this process, you can raise the water level arbitrarily high 20 units at a time. If you do the opposite and leave when it's below the median, you can lower it the same way. That's However, interesting. this is easier said than done. <clears throat> the loading zone is in the middle of an underwater tunnel, which means Mario cannot simply stay here and swim in circles around the loading zone to raise or lower the water as he pleases. He needs to get some air from time to time, so the water in the main area needs to be at its lowest level. To access this corner, you can simply slide along this ledge, carefully keeping Mario on with the precise angle and stick movement. And now, Mario has just barely enough time to lower the water level once before he has to rush back and get some air. So this process is extremely tedious. To wow. get this part done without actually repeating all of this work over and over for days, Pan and Kuek figured out a way to make a sequence of inputs that would be loopable, and repeated it for however many iterations he needed. After lowering the water 26 times, he could finally enter downtown. By now, the water was low enough that he could get some air inside the tunnel itself and he could go and break this first box. But as you can see, this grate prevents him from lowering the water any more than that because it would block access to downtown if he did, so Panin had to raise the water instead. He does so for 4 hours. In that time, the water level is raised 398 times. Now the water level is far above the top of the stage. At this point, it's so high up that when Mario touches a low crystal, he has time to swim up to a higher platform before the water level catches up. Or at least he would if he had enough air. Unfortunately, bee swimming is so slow that Mario would drown before he got there. But thankfully, coins restore energy. By grabbing a few coins along the way, Panin was able to extend his underwater time just enough to make this genius route possible. After this high anxiety swim up to the top, Mario is now high up in zero A presses. Oh my gosh, low, right in time. Look at that. Mario is now high up in zero A presses. Oh wow. While the water is low, which lets him break boxes, and he has access to the high crystal so he can raise the water back up and go back to the main area if needed. He activates the high crystal and dives down to one of the boxes to break it just before the water catches up. From there, he only needs to get some air and he can go back and repeat this process again to break more boxes. And that's what he does. For another 4 hours, he raises the water 366 times and repeats the same process. However, coins are limited so he has to become more and more creative with how he uses them to buy himself more underwater time. The longer he has to go out of his way to get more coins, the more coins he needs to get to offset that extra time. This time, he has just barely enough time to break this second box. Then he goes back and raises the water another 376 times, uses up the last few yellow coins he has to his disposal, and breaks one more box. In one final trip, he raises the water 154 times and then, with almost no coins left to keep him alive, collects all the red coins that he left behind specifically for this moment and he breaks off the last few boxes That's and gets insane. the star. All of that in zero A presses and only 14 hours. Even among all the cloning he had done, only this single star hours. was probably the most intense strategy Pan and Koek had pulled off up to this point. It also saved an astonishing 8 A presses in a single go, making it to this day the largest single improvement in the challenge's history. Really? And he wasn't even done yet. But he was almost done. He took a look at the red coin stars in the first two Bowser stages and found some improvements in them. In Bowser in the Dark World, he lured a Goomba down here so he could bounce on it and used frame walking to tilt the bridge 90 degrees and go up to red coin, saving three A presses in total to bring it down to two. In Bowser in the Fire Sea, he was able to use a bob -omb to clone the star, saving the two A presses normally required to get up to it and grab it. In the final level he still had to go through, Snowman's Land, only two A presses remained and he was able to save one of them. He got in the deep freeze from 1 to 0 A presses using Koopa Shell Hyperspeed. This had already been used before by the Japanese dancers, but I glossed over it until now. Here's how it works. The way speed on slopes is handled is fairly simple. When Mario is moving on a slope, his speed is calculated in such a way that he moves the same distance along that slope than if he were in flat ground. So with a speed of 30 on flat ground, Mario will move 30 units forward. But on a 30 degree slope, Mario will move by 30 units along the slope, which translates so, uh, to 15 uh, units up. 
and oh, yeah. 26 units forward. The way the game does this is that it factors Mario's speed by the cosine of the slope he's on to determine his lateral movement and then moves him up or down to match the new height of the floor. This effective speed, which is always equal to or lower than Mario's real speed, is called the de facto speed. Now this method works flawlessly when Mario is running parallel to the direction of the slope, but if he's moving perpendicularly to it, this speed reduction no longer makes sense. Nonetheless, it is still applied no matter which direction Mario is moving in. This is why he appears to slow down when going from flat ground to sloped ground despite keeping a similar speed, and this is the mechanic that makes shell hyperspeed possible. When Mario tries to ride up a steep slope, he'll rapidly lose speed and even slide back down the slope. But if he's angled right, something interesting can happen. The backwards acceleration is the same so long as Mario is facing up the slope, even if he barely is. Because the slope is so steep, his de facto speed is a tiny fraction of his real speed, so he basically stays in place despite his increasingly high speed. So by facing ever That's so, so cool. slightly up very steep slopes, he can accumulate over 200 negative speed, about 7 times more than regular walking speed. All he needs to do next is to redirect that speed to propel himself to the star in 0 8 That is so neat. There were only a few stars left. Rainbow Ride 100 coins was moderately easy with the techniques Panin had developed. After 1A press to reach the cruiser, he was able to get a hold of an exploding bob bomb and clone 51 coins to reach 100 without <laughs> having to go around the whole course. By the I, way, I like how he like one coins to made that ring around, the, to go around the, the whole That's course. funny. By the way, a quick detail. While there are other bob bombs in Rainbow Ride, to grab an exploding bob bomb, Mario needs to be at least a tiny bit higher than the explosion, either with a higher ledge or a slope. Rainbow Ride's floors are almost all perfectly flat, so the best way to clone a bob bomb was to use the rim of the ship to provide the high differential. Dire Dire Dog's 100 coins was a little more complicated. Using the shell method that he used to clone poles in a star, he could clone coins, but there is a more efficient <laughs> method. Instead of cloning coins one by one, he could clone an entire ring of coins. Like we've seen before, rings of coins are handled by an intangible invisible object called the spawner. On top of deciding when to load or unload a group of coins, it also keeps track of which of its coins have been collected so it can stay consistent when you load the coins in and out of memory. However, just like every other object, coin ring spawners can be cloned. Here's how the process works. The cloning part works exactly the same. But to clone an object, you need to be holding a vacant slot for it to load into. The problem with spawners is that they are loaded when you enter the level, and they always stay loaded no matter how far Mario is from them. There is, however, one exception. If a level has multiple segments separated by a loading zone, such as Wet Dry World or Dire Dire Docks, then it is possible to load and unload a spawner. When a spawner is cloned, it will simply look like an invisible object. Just like any other object not meant to be thrown, once the clone is released, it will cease to function properly. So it will also stop handling the loading and unloading of the coin ring. If a coin spawner clone is released, its associated coin ring will no longer load when Mario goes near it. But if the spawner clone is released while the coins are already loaded, then they will no longer unload when Mario goes far away. Also, huh. when a coin from a coin ring is cloned, because its behavior is broken, it will be unable to send a signal to its spawner to indicate that it's been collected, so the spawner will spawn it <laughs> again when Mario goes near, thus duplicating the coin. This works exactly the same way if the spawner is the one being cloned. The coins in a ring can be collected, and it will send a signal to the spawner that they no longer should be loaded the next time the ring is loaded, but the spawner will be unable to receive the message. So when Mario reloads the area through the loading zone, the reloaded spawner wow. will have no memory of the coins being collected, and it will spawn them all over again. This method can be used specifically in Dire Dire Docks to duplicate whole rings of coins at once instead That's of crazy. one time, significantly speeding up the process. This is what Panin did. He got 56 extra coins from 7 coin ring spawner clones and got the 100 coin star in 0.5 A-presses. Around this time, he also found an improvement in Wet Dry World in Express Elevator Hurry Up. He found that by raising the water level, he was able to hold A and swim onto the elevator instead of jumping to it. The timing for it is very tight, but it is indeed possible. This reduced the A-press count from 1 to 0.5 because he needed A to be held and not pressed. At this point, Panenkoek was nearing the end of his journey through every star in the game. He realized that he also needed to account for all the A-presses necessary to navigate the castle between all the levels. So he dedicated a video to all of them. Most of it is pretty trivial, and like I discussed before, the total comes up to 23 if you're being efficient. 
He found one precise side flip to grab the ledge to rainbow right on one side and wing Mario over the rainbow on the other, which brought the total down to 21. He proved that the 5 stars available inside the castle itself were all obtainable in 0 A presses. And he completed his meticulous run through the complete A button challenge in Womp's Fortress by doing Fall into the Caged Island the same way the Japanese Tassers did it a few years prior. Finally, after all of this work, Pan and Koek, with some help from Plush, managed to cut the 120 star A press count nearly in half from 208 to 116. But we lost track of time during this epic journey. How many years have passed? Three years? Four years? Maybe even five years? How about two months? That's Holy crap! Two months, okay. Two months, and recording and editing that one star that took 14 hours was like part of that two months. That's right. That's this crazy. This entire revolution of the Super Mario 64 A button challenge took two months from beginning to end. And the best part? He was only getting started. Bro, there's another to be continued. He actually did this to us.